Hey, Pastor Josh here. Thanks so much for watching our videos. If you'd like more information about Legacy City Church, you can go to LegacyCityChurch.com. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell below. God bless you. We're in Genesis chapter 32 in our Bibles. Genesis chapter 32. And the title of the message is crippling grace. Crippling grace. We will see this in our story today. It's a very interesting term, but I think very fitting for what we will see. Heard of a little boy who wanted a bike for Christmas really, really bad. But the kid was a really bad seed, and he knew it. And so he writes Jesus a letter for Christmas asking for this bike. He says, Dear Jesus, if I get a bike for Christmas, I'll be good a whole week. Seven days. He thinks about it again. He crosses that out and he writes and says, I can't be good for a whole week. I'll be good for five days. He crosses that out and he says, I'll be good for four days. He thinks again and crosses that out. He gets down to one day and says, I can't even be good for one day. Then in frustration, he goes into his mother's room where the nativity scene is sitting there and he gets the statue of the Virgin Mary and he wraps it up in a blanket and he puts it in a paper bag. He throws it in the closet and says, Dear Jesus, if I don't get my bike for Christmas, you'll never see your mother again. <laughs> You, you can use that one for Christmas if you want. It worked. Just a joke. Crippling grace. You know, the Lord has a way of getting our attention, especially when we don't want to let him have our attention especially when our eyes and our ears are focused in a different direction. I find it odd, well, not odd, but I, I find it surprising that over and over as I pray, Lord, grow me to be more like you. Bring me into closer relationship with you. Change me. Lord, make me more patient. Soon and very soon, the Lord will have me in a situation that is causing me to grow in patience. And it is not easy. And as I pray and I beg the Lord, please grow me in closer relationship with you. I want to know you. I want to be dependent on you. Many times the only way I will become dependent is if something shows in, up in my life that brings me to my knees, which causes me to be fully dependent upon him. And this is not easy. We pray, Lord, I want to be sold out for you. I want all of my life to be yours. But the process in which we transfer our life over to his is a breaking off of so many other things in our lives that we want to hold on, so many things in our kingdom. You've heard the phrase, there are no atheists in foxholes. That when the atheist is sent out to war and the enemy is on the other side and they know that they are about to be taken hostage and tortured and probably killed and are thinking about their family back at home and they just want to get out of it. As they're hiding in that foxhole away from the enemy, they magically start crying out to God because they need someone to save them. And I want to propose this to you today that could it be that though we want to draw close to the Lord, though we have great desires to draw close to Him, many times we do not draw as close as we want to unless we are brought to a very low place. And then the growing begins. Why is it in some of the darkest seasons of our life, right on the other side of it has been the most growth? Where God has taken us really from valley low all the way to mountaintops. Unless you reach the low point, you will never see the mountaintop. We see this in our story today. 
Family, I see this over and over and over again in my life, and I wish it was different. I honestly wish I didn't have to grow in the midst of pain, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of trial, in the midst of struggle. But I'm telling you, as of right now, it seems this is the way the universe is spun. Today we will see Jacob leave his uncle Laban, going back home to meet his brother Esau. What was Esau's name? What does it mean? Harry. Yeah, he was a beast. Of, just think of my beard times like four, okay? He was, he was, he had a massive hairy beard. He, use your imagination. He had a big afro probably. He had huge hair. But he was so hairy, remember, he had to disguise himself with, cam Jacob had to disguise himself as his brother with camel's hair on his arms. This dude was a beast. And 20 years ago, Jacob left his brother because his brother wanted to murder him. Because Jacob stole his older brother's birthright. And today is the day in our story that he is on his way back home to meet his brother Esau. We're in Genesis chapter 32. Can we stand for the reading of God's word? We always stand for the reading of God's word to pay honor to him. Remember whose word we are reading. It's not mine. Mine will never change you. God's word will change you forever. This thing is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts into the soul. It discerns between the heart and the mind, the spirit and the soul. It speaks directly to us. The story before us, let's read 12 verses together. Genesis 32, starting in verse 1, it says, Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So he called the name of that place Mahanaim. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, to the country of Eden, instructing them, Thus ye shall say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, and female servants I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and there are 400 men with him. Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two camps, thinking, if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is to the left will escape. And Jacob said, O oh God, my father, he prays, Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O oh Lord, who said to me, return to your country, to your kindred that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan and now I have become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him. And he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, O oh Lord, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've written down this story, and we ask, Lord, that you would minister to us today. You would illuminate this text. You would help us to understand grace even deeper. While we were enemies, you reached out to us. Please, Lord, save us again today. We need you to show up. Minister to our deepest need, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Again, if you missed last week, Jacob took his 11 sons and his four wives and left his sneaky, slimy, used car salesman, Uncle Laban, who tried for 20 years to take advantage of him. But the Lord God was watching and took all of Laban's wealth and through one business deal gave it all back to Jacob. Do you remember? 
the striped and the spotted animals. Jacob's like, I want the striped and spotted. You take the solid colored animals and let's divide these sheep. That'll be my pay. Well, they were rare. Remember, the striped and spotted were, were rare. Jacob only would have a few of them, but he figured out a way through a dream that God had given him how to multiply this livestock. And he did multiply them to which the striped and spotted multiplied to such a great number that it overtook the solid colored animals. And Laban was up left with nothing and Jacob had great wealth. We saw it unfold in a message titled, If God Had Not Been On My Side. If God had not been on my side, where would I be, Jacob said. But now God has blessed me. Verse 1 tells us that as Jacob left to return home to his family, did you see it? Verse 1, that the angels of God met him and went with him. Angels of God. Verse 2, it says, and when Jacob saw them, Jacob actually saw angels. And this is not a dream. He was awake. He was fully awake and he saw angels. And he said, this is God's camp. That's how many angels there were. When he shows up, he's on his way home and he's on his journey. He's got his families with him, his flocks. He's on his way home. And all of a sudden, they see an encampment of angels. So he calls the name of that place Manhanaim, which means God's camp. He named the place God's camp because of how many angels there were. He probably saw thousands of them. Because any other time in the Old Testament when someone saw, when the veil was pulled back and they saw the angels of God, there were thousands of them, sometimes tens of thousands. Who knows how many, but he saw them. Are angels real? Yes. They are very real. And they're not fat babies in the sky with wings. No, no. They're, that's Cupid, yes. They're not beautiful women who have died and gone to heaven either. I know we like to think that. My wife is definitely an angel. But they are actually created beings. They are not humans. They're created spiritual beings of God. And they are his messengers and his workers. Are there angels here now? Yes. Yes. The city of angels. There are angels in this city. There are angels in this place. The New Testament tells us that they listen. They listen in conversation, even in church meetings, because they are discovering grace. Notice the angels never received grace. The angels a third of them rebelled against God. Do you remember? Satan took with him a third of the angels and they are now demons, fallen angels. Do you remember any savior being sent to die on a cross for angels? No. They are all condemned to hell immediately for their departure and rebellion against God. But what has God done for humans? He says, they rebelled against me, but I will send my son down to the earth to die for their sin, pay for their sin, so that they can have a relationship with me. And the, the Bible says, the New Testament tells us, the Apostle Paul writes that the angels look on discovering grace that humans are experiencing with God. They've never experienced it. They are here. Angels, can you hear us? We're so locked into a physical world that we forget how much spiritual is going on. As much physical as you see, there is spiritual happening in this city as well, both good and evil. I've said this before, I'll say it again, if there is any place on the earth that we would know that the devil, Lucifer, the head angel, 
would actually walk on the earth and try to disrupt and destroy, it would definitely be the city of Los Angeles. If there was any place to hang out and destroy and tear down, why wouldn't you influence a city that is influencing the whole world? Of course. There is so much spiritual activity happening in this city, way more than the traffic on the freeway. They are a part of all of it. We need to allow our minds to realize that we are not in a physical war with people. We are in a spiritual war. Ephesians 6.12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Stop fighting with each other. Stop it. Just stop. You're not fighting against flesh and blood. But we are fighting against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. And praise God, Psalm 34, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. The angel of the Lord shows up over and over and over in the New Testament. All of a sudden, boom, there's this angel. Do you remember the angel of the Lord when Hezekiah was in great fear of the of the enemies coming at him. It was a Lord of the Rings scenario. Big armies coming at this king. And Hezekiah doesn't know what to do and he gets on his knees and he cries out to God, Lord, save us. There's 180,000 men out there. I don't know what to do. They're going to destroy the castle. They're going to destroy all innocent people inside the walls. Deliver us. And it says that night the angel of the Lord showed up and slay 180,000 men in one night. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Psalm 91, 11, for we will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. The psalmist, speaking about the future Messiah, a prophecy about him, but also speaking about his real situation, writing a song about angels who will protect him. Hebrews 13, 2, one of my favorites about angels, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. An angel standing there in L.A., a stranger. Who is that guy? Who is that girl? Don't neglect to show hospitality. Somebody walks up and asks you for some food. I'm sorry, I'm too busy. It's Christmas season. I got a bunch of stuff to buy for myself and other people. The angel's like, thank you. I don't know if I've ever entertained an angel, but I've had some pretty crazy moments where things like that have happened, where literally you go and do somebody for something, you turn around and they're just gone. And you're like, okay, uh, they're either really fast or they just disappeared. I don't know what happened, but they are here. Hebrews 1.14, this is what angels do. Are they not ministering spirits, spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? They are ministering spirits sent to minister to us. I love to pray this over people in the hospital. I love to pray this over people who need to be ministered to. Lord, send angels to minister to them to serve them, to love them, to help them. God had sent angels to minister to to Jacob. Isn't this great? Jacob's like, I'm scared. I'm going home to my family I haven't seen in 20 years and my brother wants to kill me. God says, let me open your eyes and he sees an angel. Angels, an encampment of angels sitting there before him. Do you remember Bible students, the angels met Jacob when he left 20 years ago, when he left home. Do you remember in the desert? He had a dream and he saw angels descending and ascending from a ladder there in his dream and God was telling him I'm with you he was at the top of the ladder he saw a vision of God 
And he saw the angels coming up and down the ladder with him in the middle of the desert when he was running from his family. He was scared. God says, I'm with you, and I got angels with you. When he leaves after 20 years, what does God do again? Shows him and reveals to him, angels are there. What a beautiful picture, huh? The Lord is with us. The Lord is with and protects those who fear him. We do not need to be afraid. We do not need to be scared no matter what happens to us in this life. The Lord is with us and his plan is being carried out. Look at verse three to six. It says, Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them. He says this, I want you to say this to my brother. Servants, employees, listen guys, I want you to go to my brother, and this is what you're going to say to him. Thus you shall say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob. Look at the language. Look at Jacob lowering himself before his brother. Jacob could have been like this. Hey, brother, I'm coming home. You mess with me. I got a thousand angels with me. I will drop you like a bad habit. You come at me, bro, and I am going to have the Lord level you, right? No, he doesn't do that. He says, thus you shall say to, listen, employees, servants, team, come together. I want you to say this to my brother. No, no. You will say this to my Lord, Esau. This is not just a polite way to talk back in that day. He is literally lowering lowering himself below his brother because he wants to win him. And he's not being flattering. He's being genuine and sincere. He says, thus you shall say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, servant I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, female servants. I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. The messengers returned to Jacob and said to him, We went to your brother and we told him and he's coming to meet you. Verse 6, and there are 400 men with him. So Jacob's servants go and they say just that, Esau. My Lord, Jacob, your servant, is coming. And he wants to meet with you. And he wants to find favor in your sight. Look at him laying down. We don't do that here in L.A., huh? No, I'm not laying down nobody. I'm not going to get humble I'm not going to put aside the pride and the arrogance. I'm not going to lower myself as a servant before somebody else. There's no way. But why wouldn't we, Christian? Was it not Jesus who said, I came not to this earth to be served, but to serve and give myself a ransom for many? I am here on the earth. I am the king of the universe, Jesus would say. And I am here as a servant. I'm here to serve my people. Jacob learned this from the Lord, and he humbles himself. Remember, Jacob stole the birthright of his brother, and Esau wanted to kill him for it. Murder. And Jacob had to flee town. And so there was animosity, and Jacob didn't know what happened over the 20 years. All the news that he gets back is Esau says, Okay, thank you. And then all of a sudden the servants step back and they see Esau get up and start showing up with 400 men. 400 men. That's a small army. That could do some damage. There's going to be bloodshed for sure. Verse 7, look, take a look at the text. And Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two camps, thinking, if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is to the left will escape. So Jacob's like, okay, we've got to put together an army strategy, a war tactic here. I'm going to divide all of my people, and I'm going to put one over here to the left and one over here to the right. Whichever one Esau attacks, 
the other will still be alive because he's probably going to take out the other. But look at what happens. Jacob makes one small move, but it says here, and I'm so thankful for this, Jacob is scared, and he, so he cries out to God in verse 9. This is a different Jacob, isn't it? Normally, he would take matters into his own hands, and instead, he goes to the Lord first. Jacob was a can-do kind of guy. He liked to make things happen. Remember, he, he, he would work his own angles. he say, you know what? I'm not going to go to the Lord first. I'm just going to do my thing and make something happen. I want you to see the prayer of Jacob. Watch his heart in this prayer. Take a look closely, verse 9. Jacob says, O oh God, my father, O oh God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, O oh Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred that I may do good. He prays to the Lord, says, Lord, you called me. He honors the Lord first. And then he says, I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown your servant. What a prayer. He honors the Lord. He says, Lord, you have called me. And then he says, I remember the deeds of your steadfast love. He's broken. We see humility. He says, I'm not worthy of the blessings that you have poured upon me. He calls himself a servant of the Most High God. Remember, Jacob was a wealthy, powerful person at this point, And he refers to himself as a servant of God. This is a very important way to pray, a very good way, a good, nice little template here. To first, honor the Lord for who He is and what He has called you to, and then second, to remember His steadfast love and His deeds in your life. How often do we forget what the Lord has done? Jacob is remembering back to what God has done, how faithful he has been, how he has never left him. He is reminding himself, and he is praying this to the Lord, and this is strengthening him as he's praying. Watch his family as you say, Lord, we worship you. We honor you for who you are. Thank you for calling me. I recognize that you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I've seen your faithfulness. Lord, I remember my family was in a rough situation. You delivered us there. Lord, I remember your love showed up when I was in turmoil with this, in this situation, Lord, I remember your faithfulness and your goodness to me. You've never left me. You're here today. He says specifically, for with only my staff, I cross this Jordan. And now I've become two camps. Look what he's saying. He says, basically, I walked into this town with a dime, a paper clip, and some lint in my pocket. I had my staff, a piece of wood, that's all I had. And I walked out of that town 20 years later with two encampments. You have blessed me, O oh God. You have been faithful to me. And notice, he does not say that he built himself. He did not build himself. God built him, and he knows without God, he would not be where he is today. It's a great danger of human beings to ever think that they have brought themselves to where they are today, to ever take credit. Honestly, you, you, on the surface, you can take credit for things. Well, I put in the time, I put in the work, I put in the effort, I put in the desire. At the end of the day, you have to ask yourself the question, where did all of that come from? Who gave you the work? Who gave you the talent? Who gave you the ability? Who gave you the personality? Who gave you the desire? Who gave you the family? Who gave you the city? Who gave you the opportunity? Who, who, who? The Apostle Paul writes, what do we have that we did not receive? It has all come from him, and I get it. We gotta pull up our bootstraps and work hard. I love to work hard. But at the end of the day, when the blessings show up, 
when the favor shows up, when the success shows up, we give all honor and glory to God. It's him who did the work in me, and I'm shocked that I even get to be a part of it. Jacob says, I just crossed over with a staff, and you blessed me with two encampments. He doesn't say, I built this business. I built this wealth. He says, God, you did it in me. You gave me favor, and I don't know why you did this for me. I'm in awe of your grace. Verse 11, please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me and my wives, the mothers of my children and the kids. He might kill them all. Notice Jacob honors the Lord. Then he remembers the greatness of God and what he had done in his life. Then and only then does he bring supplication. He asks for his needs to be taken care of. Notice the pattern of the Lord's prayer right here in our text. He says, please, Lord, deliver me, save me, help. So many times this is the first starting of our prayer, huh? We go, I got to go pray, Lord, help. We forget all the other stuff. Me too, I'm telling you. Too often, I'm anxious to be helped and taken care of, delivered. But what a prayer. He says, God, please deliver me. How many of us need to just pray that simple prayer today? God, deliver me. Deliver me from that. Deliver me from these things. Help me. I need you. I'm not doing this on my own. Deliver me declares you can't deliver yourself. Full dependence on the Almighty. Then he quotes scripture to finish his prayer. I love this. So good, he says, but you said, O God. He quotes God's word. He says, you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. He says, Lord, you said this. This is a powerful way to pray. And this brings God's word in. What he has said, what he has declared, his promises. I'll never forget this. When I was living in Mexico with a bunch of young guys, we were sitting under this pastor, learning under him for four months, and he was teaching us to pray. I'll never forget uh, one of the brothers, Christian Lounger, he, he stands up and he says, brothers, I want to share one of the tips that's really been a blessing to me. He says, when you pray, he's like, when I pray, what I love to do So after I've opened in prayer, I've spent some time with the Lord, he says, he will go back to the word of God. He will take his Bible. He will open it to scripture and verse. He will put his finger on the verse. And as he prays, he'll say, Lord, you have said in your word that you will provide my needs according to your riches and glory. And I don't need to worry. You said it right there. And I trust your word above my words, above my thinking, above my ways. I trust you, O God, to bring God's word back in to prayer. What a powerful message. What a powerful way to reinforce what God has said. That's exactly what Jacob's doing. He said, Lord, my brother is coming to kill my family, but you said that you will multiply my descendants like the sands on the seashore. And so, Lord, I'm trusting your word above my own thoughts. I'm clinging to you. I love that picture. Look at verse 13 to 16. It says, so he stayed there all night. In prayer, maybe he was praying still, I don't know. And from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milking cows and their calves, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, 10 male donkeys. It's a lot of animals, huh? What if I gave you that gift on Christmas? <laughs> a farm shows up at your house, you're like, oh, thank you. No, this was cash money right here. This was big dollars. Verse 16, these he handed over to his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, pass on ahead of me and put a space between drove and drove. This is what he does. 
First off, he takes groups of these animals and he sends one at a time. Send that group to create some space. Send the next group, create some space. Send the next group of animals, create some space. Send the next group of animals, create some space. And servants with each group. Why was he doing this? He wanted to overwhelm his brother Esau with grace. When his brother sees him coming, he's like, wow, a gift. He's like, oh, there's 30 cows. My Lord Esau, your servant Jacob wants to bring a gift to you for favor, please. He's trying to make peace. He's like, wow, okay, wow, I don't know if I can receive this. And then what does he see coming next? Another one. And then another one. And then another one. And then another one. And the droves of animals keep going. He gives 550 animals in total. This is a gift equivalent to giving up for a king. Millions of dollars he's throwing in his direction. These animals will produce and guarantee they are the best of his flock, the strongest. They will reproduce, compound, and create great wealth for his brother. He could turn those 550 into 1,000 with just one season. He could turn those 1,000 into 2,000 in just another season. Those 2,000 into 4,000 in just a third season. That's a lot of animals. That's a lot of money. Jacob wanted to give his brother back, watch this, the inheritance that he stole from him. He says, brother, I stole that from you. And I want you to know, I want to give you it all back. He's saying, God has given me much. God has been gracious to me. I am going to be gracious to you. Notice Jacob was pouring grace on Esau, his enemy. Why? Because God had poured grace on him. Luke 6, 28, Jesus says, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Romans 5, 10 says, for if while we were God's enemies, we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, Jesus, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? God saw us as enemies. We ran from him. We rebelled against him. We were haters of God. As the world is today. And God says, I lay my, on my life for these people and I will make them friends, sons and daughters of the king. That grace, family, we are to be pouring upon this world. And I know it is not easy. Trust me, when somebody cuts me off, I do not want to walk up and wave and Merry Christmas, you know. I want to, you know, speed up and break check up, baby. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <clears throat> People are mean right now, huh, during the season. Dude, they're aggressive. I was in the Best Buy parking lot this last week. Oh, man, it was a nightmare. But what a light we get to be, huh? Aren't you thankful that Jesus showed up in our chaos? When we were the ones in road rage, he steps in and loves and serves us and says, go right ahead. Let me serve you. What a gracious king he is. And if we have drank of this grace, how can we not pour it back upon the world? Jacob had tasted in his younger years, he was brutal. He was ruthless. He was cutthroat. He would cut you off. In his older years, he's 20 years older, he says, no, 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 no. God has been good to me. I'm going to show the hand of grace. Look at verse 17 to 22. He instructed the first, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, to whom do you belong? Where do you belong? And who are those, these ahead of you? Then you shall say they belong to your servant Jacob. They are a present sent to my Lord Esau. Moreover, he is behind us. And likewise instructed the second and the third and all those who followed the droves. You shall say the name. You shall say the same thing to Esau when you find him. And you shall say, Moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me. And afterward I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. Perhaps he will accept me. Man, what a phrase for Los Angeles. 
perhaps they will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him, and he himself stayed that night in the camp. He told each servant to say the same thing, your, Jacob, your servant Jacob is behind us. Here's a bunch of cows. Your servant Jacob is behind us. Here's a bunch of goats. Your servant Jacob is behind us. Here's milking camels. You want to milk some camels? He's got them. But this was one of the heaviest nights of Jacob's life. He was about to face his brother. He needed the Lord. Can you imagine the night before seeing your brother, whom you haven't seen for 20 years, who is your enemy, wants to kill you? It says in verse 22. The same night he arose and took his two wives, two female servants, and his 11 children and crossed the fort of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man, watch this, in the middle of the night, a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Such a random verse, huh? Sitting there at night reflecting on the next day in fear and all of a sudden some dude walks up and puts him in a headlock trying to get him in a triangle in the middle of the night Jacob's just sitting there and it says there they wrestle all night it's like a six seven hour match UFC's got nothing on this one right you get your money's worth on this one a wrestling match and Jacob didn't know who it was he had no clue he's like what is this dude doing is it one of Esau's guys like trying to like take me down I'm gonna own this dude and they start wrestling and they wrestle all night and it says verse 25 when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob he touched his hip socket he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of the joint as he wrestled him they're like wrestling all night long and he like can't get Jacob in the full triangle like he can't get him out and so he's like okay forget this and the man just touch just just touches the hip and it pulls out of the socket you ever had a bone pop out of the socket They're like paralyzed and there he lays there and his hip is out of joint Jacob then knew that this was a supernatural being. Who can touch a hip and it just goes out of socket? Not even Bruce Lee can do this. So then he said to him, verse 26, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said this, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I'm not letting go until you bless me he knows that it's a divine being and he says I want your blessing I want your favor and I am not letting go Hosea tells us in chapter 12 verse 4 that he strove with the angel and prevailed and he wept and sought for favor Jacob when he is wrestling with this guy he's been wrestling all night he starts to cry he starts to weep he says I'm not letting go I'm not letting go until you bless me I'm not letting go of you God I'm not letting go I'm gonna stay near please don't get far from me I'm not letting go until you bless me Jacob wept he wanted God's favor in his life and I love this he's basically putting God in a headlock and just holding him as tight as he could and saying I need you and I will not let go until I have your blessing in my life oh if the church was this fervent in their relationship with God I'm not letting go of this prayer time I'm not letting go of this time in the word I'm not letting go of your ministry I'm not letting go of your work until you bless me I want your favor I want your work in my life oh Lord above all things in life I need this and I love this he says to him what is your name Jacob what is your name he knew his name the angel of God knew his name did he not he knew who it was he says what's your name 
Jacob caught off, off guard. What is your name? He says, my name is Heel Catcher. My name is Trickster. My name is Deceiver. My name is Depend on Myself. My name is Make Things Happen on My Own. Confession. What is your name? He said, I am the sneaky one, the trickster Jacob that you know. And he says to him, no longer will your name be Jacob. You will not be called heel catcher anymore. You will be called Israel, governed by God. I will change your name from now on and you will be my man and no longer your man. You will seek my kingdom and no longer your own. You will give over yourself to me. The Lord, watch this, in a couple verses, did a life transforming moment for Jacob. Watch this, he touched his hip and he crippled him. And then he changed his name. The text tells us that Jacob would limp for the rest of his life. And his name would align with the limping. He would never forget this moment. That no longer would he rely on himself, he would rely on God. The Lord crippled Jacob and gave him a new name. He touched his hip. He removed his ability to walk on his own on the earth. From now on, he would limp all of his life and he would never forget that God is who he needs to lean on and trust on, not himself. And that's why I titled this message, Crippling Grace. Crippling Grace, I want to close in this point. I don't want you to miss this because it is a powerful, powerful point in life. Crippling Grace, could it be that God would allow a pain or a suffering or a trial or a tribulation to come into your life that may cripple you for the rest of your life. Let it be physically, financially, emotionally to which you will have to rely on Him, Israel, governed by God for the rest of your entire life. 2 Corinthians 12, 7, there was someone that this happened to in the New Testament. Do you remember his name, Paul? And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me by God, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, he says, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it may depart from me. I begged God three times to take it away, and God said to him, my grace, my grace, my grace, my grace is sufficient for you. You don't need to be healed of this, Paul. Therefore, most gladly, he says, I will rather boast in my affirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my affirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. Here it is, family. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak and dependent on God, I am the most strong in life. When you are strong in yourself and dependent on you, you are weak in your relationship with God. Grace that cripples us. Would God allow something like this in your life? Would God allow something like this in my life? Oh yes, he has. And I pray and beg, Lord, take these things away from me. Why do I have to go through these things? Please. Lord says, no, when everything's bright and everything's perfect in life, you don't walk with me. You stop praying. You stop reading. You stop seeking me. Thus, I will allow these things to be on your life to keep you crippled in me. Look at verse 29 to 32. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. <laughs> and he said, why is it that you ask my name? He answered him with a question. 
He's like, you already know who this is. And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed through Penuel, limping because of his hip. There it is. Limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Family, God's grace is sufficient for us. I know we want to say, I need this, I need that, I need this, I need that. No, you don't. You need God. Me too. I need that first and foremost. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you. You seek him first, and he'll take care of the rest. Amen? Please don't look at your affirmities today and your trial and your heaviness in life today as a burden. Try to see it through the lens of God's eyes as a blessing. He's doing something. He's up to something. Amen?